Psychology in Seattle. Hey, deserving listeners. Today, I'm going to read your emails and respond to them. But before I do that, let's introduce the podcast. This is the podcast called Psychology in Seattle, and I am your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. This first email is from patron Courtney. She writes, I was cheated on in the past, and my ex was very secretive about social media because he was seeing other women behind my back. My current boyfriend doesn't really use social media all that often, but the possibility of that happening again keeps nagging at me, and the fact that my boyfriend reacts defensively about it doesn't help. This has been the most healthy relationship that I have been in in my life, and I'm worried that if I continue to approach this in the wrong way, I will push him away. But not bringing it up at all causes these feelings to flare up intensely at random, and I'm suffering. Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. End of email. Yeah, good question, patron Courtney. A lot of people are suffering from this. You've been relationally traumatized at the very least by your ex who was secretly cheating on you. This is a massive trauma. And I want to emphasize this for everybody. To be cheated on is horrible. To be cheated on repeatedly for a long period of time is a very, very intense trauma. The depending on the organization of the relationship, but you know, most relationships are organized in such a way that the two people are saying, you know, we're dedicated to each other. We're not going to cheat on each other. We're not going to have sex with other people. And we're going to be honest with each other about, you know, the important things. And to, and usually what happens is the cheating is, um, isn't discovered until much later on. Right. And what ends up happening is the cheated on partner upon learning about all the cheating will uh, sort of think back on all those weeks and months and maybe years of relationship that now have to be seen in a new light. All those times where your spouse kissed you or made love to you or uh, you know, it said they loved you or, or said, no, I'm not cheating or said, oh, I'm staying late at the office or I'm meeting up with my friends or you came, you know, they came home really late and they, their excuse seemed a little weird. All those moments, which are hundreds, thousands of moments are now painted in a brand new light. And the light is, the, the rational light that, you know, is shed on that is, so that whole time you were lying to me. That whole time, uh, that time you were lying to me, that time, all those days you were, with, you were withholding something from me that was very important to me. And you were the one person on this planet who I thought uh, had my back. You were, you know, I... I don't worry about a random acquaintance doing this to me, but you were that person to me. You were that person I was giving all my trust and love to. And for you to uh, do this to me for so long, you know, the the sexual component of cheating is one thing, but in my experience, it's it's the attachment and trust that's broken that is uh, the majority of the problem. and the, the meaning that, that gets flipped, right? It's like you, you, you're walking around in your relationship and you're like, um, oh, you know, yeah, we're in love and yeah, we have our conflicts, but you know, we've got each other's backs and we're honest with each other and, and we're a team. We're together. It's, it's me and my partner and we're together. We're in a relationship. And then to find out again, weeks, months, maybe years later, that all of that was essentially false. And that whole time, while you were just uh, believing something, it wasn't true. The whole time, it was not true. Now, people can recover from infidelity, and I've worked with couples and individuals along those lines, but it's earth shattering, this, this revelation. And cheating people typically uh, don't understand the impact that it has on the cheated on partner. So uh, they just sort of forge ahead. But anyway, so 
the uh, the now I understand why people cheat. I I can conceptualize it and understand the uh, the acting out and the attachment uh, injuries that they're acting out or whatever they're you know the cause of their cheating. But but uh, but the you know the impact on the cheated on partner is, is immense. So Courtney, you've been through something immense. It's not a small thing. A lot of people will downplay it. Like ah, uh, well you know good riddance. Uh, you you found out that he was a douchebag and you broke up and now you're better off for it. Yeah, okay, that's true. But also, Courtney, you might be uh, dealing with the grief of that of that cheating for the rest of your life. It it's it's traumatic. Uh, again, if it's it's one thing to get in a fight like a verbal conflict with your spouse. But at least it's in your face, right? At least you know what's happening. At least there's not this, this like conniving deception, and this ongoing uh, trickery that from someone who might even be living with you. Uh, that is earth shattering to think that someone again that you know your spouse maybe they live with you, they're conniving right underneath your nose. The again the one person that you would think would not do that to you, or at the very least would say, um, I think I want a divorce or something, or I want to break up. And so it's a big deal. And I, I want Courtney, you to understand that um, it's normal to have ongoing feelings and that your current boyfriend needs to accommodate for that in the same way that I'm sure you accommodate any sort of traumas that he has from his life. And what you're talking about is a classic uh, preoccupied attachment thing. If you want more information, obviously listen to my other episodes on attachment theory and preoccupation. But, uh, you know, you're worried and you have good reasons to be worried based on your past. And your way of coping with that worry is to try to get some reassurance. And if not done right, a lot of people in your position, and you're wise to recognize this, they will actually ruin their relationship in an attempt to gain some security and some reassurance. Like uh, a very common thing that people will do in your position, Courtney, is uh, say your husband, you know, your boyfriend comes home late from work or something and you're like, where were you? And your boyfriend's like, well, what do you mean? And you're like, well, you know, you've been gone for an hour and where were you? You know, it's bullshit. Where were you? Okay. Well, so, where that comes from is from a healthy place or a normal place, which is I want, I don't want to lose my boyfriend and I'm worried about him cheating on me because that's happened to me in the past. That's normal. It's, it's, uh, it's expected, but because of our defense mechanisms, we have a hard time be, uh, acknowledging that to ourselves, let alone someone else. And so we're much more comfortable for whatever reason, it's sort of bizarre it, with being angry and accusatory. And so you end up being angry and accusatory instead of honest and vulnerable and um, that you push someone away. So, uh, so you're, you're wise to think about that. And, and I'm guessing, you know, you, you've engaged in some of that given the way that you're as, asking the question. So the question is how do we bid for security in an honest and vulnerable and non-harmful way, non-accusatory, non-aggressive, non-hostile way. And, uh, there's lots of ways, but let me dem let me role play it. And this is, it might sound corny to some of you out there, but I, and I and sometimes people say, you know, Kirk, the, the way that you propose we talk about things, it sounds corny. Well, if healthy means corny, then fucking be corny. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Like, uh, I, I find that some people think you know vulnerability is corny, and it's like, yeah, in our society, vulnerability is corny, but uh, that's because we have a cultural notion that being vulnerable is being weak and there and being goofy. And, you know, we privilege being uh, stoic and uh, independent, which of course does not lend itself to any sort of mental health. So uh, here, here's my little uh, example. So uh, you, you go up to him and you say something like, um, so I've been thinking and um, I love you and I feel like this is the best relationship I've ever been in. And I, I, I really don't want to lose you. I, I, I really want this relationship to work out well for both of us. And 
as you know, I have this past with my ex-boyfriend who cheated on me a lot. And I've come to realize that I was kind of traumatized by that. And it, it's given me this sort of mild paranoia about you, which is, not, which is unfair to you because you've never cheated on me as far as I know. I, I don't see any evidence of that. And I believe you when you say you haven't cheated on me. But I, 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 because of this trauma, I, ha I have this paranoia. And I listen to this podcast and, and, and they say that it's normal to have that paranoia after, the, uh, after being sort of through that. And I, I don't know how long that'll last. I, 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 I don't, I wish it would go away. I've tried to let it go. It doesn't really go away. It's, it's just kind of painful what happened in the past. And so uh, no fault to you. I am a little bit paranoid about you cheating on me. And uh, when, when you look at your phone, even when you just look at social media, it freaks me out. Even though I know you're just looking at Facebook or something, because my ex-boyfriend, the way he cheated on me was through a lot of social media things. And so when you look at your phone, it, it triggers me. Again, not your fault. <laughs> you're just looking at your phone. This is my baggage in my past. And uh, so uh, I just want you to know that that I'm I have this issue, and I apologize for uh, what it's you know, if, if it negatively affects you at all, which it probably already has. Like, remember last month when I got angry at you because you were on your phone so often, I, uh, that's, that's where that came from. I was paranoid and I didn't really know where it was coming from. And I ended up yelling at you because I was confused. And I know now that the reason why I was yelling at you is because I was, I was being paranoid as a result of this, of this past trauma I've been through. Um, and I'm working on it and I'm trying to uh, uh, not be paranoid. I'm trying to reassure myself. I, I'm trying to remember that you're not my ex-boyfriend and, and, you know, and I try to remind myself that you're not cheating on me, but I just have this feeling in my gut sometimes. And uh, no matter how much self-talk I do, it doesn't really go away. And so one of the ways that um, I, I think it might help me to get through this so that I, so that I'm not hurting on the inside and, and, uh, and I, I don't get triggered to be accusatory towards you. Sometimes I, I'm going to ask you to, to reassure me that you're not cheating on me, which might seem weird because it might seem to come out of nowhere. Like you might just look at your phone and then all of a sudden I need reassurance that you're not cheating on me, which of course is not your fault. It has nothing to do with you. You're free to look at your phone whenever you want, but this is my issue. And it would really, really help me if you could somehow convince me that you're not cheating on me in that moment. Because I'm not right in the head when I'm in those moments. I, uh, I'm i triggered and I'm you know, kind of freaking out on the inside. And man, the, the fastest way that you could sort of calm me down is if you could somehow just reassure me that you're not cheating on me. And of course, there's no way that you can prove it because you'd I'd have to have a drone like following you around. Uh, and, you know, I'm just going to say I've had that I've had that thought of having a drone following you around. Of course, that's ridiculous, but that's where my paranoia goes. And so if you could reassure me either by literally just saying, no, I'm not cheating on you, even though it might seem sort of silly, that actually does help me. You could also hug me and kiss me or tell me that I'm the only one for you and, uh, and that'll help, you know? Uh, I, so uh, instead of me sort of suffering silently and then being in pain and maybe even occasionally being hostile towards you and accusatory, um, I think this other way will actually really help. And then maybe over time, if we do this enough times, I won't need any reassurance like that anymore because um, I'll be, I'll, I'll be reassured enough that um, I won't need that reassurance, but it's possible that I might always occasionally need that reassurance. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, so then, you know, you throw to your boyfriend. Now, your boyfriend might not know how to react to that because some people have extremely low um, experience or emotional intelligence around this sort of thing. And they get defensive because they, they start to, because they have their triggers and they get afraid. You know, I'm guessing your boyfriend actually has his own, his own traumas. Uh, that are related to, uh, me, you know, uh, of course I have no idea because, but just based on the little bit that you wrote, um, I could see your boyfriend having 
uh, been accused of things growing up and criticized in a way that makes him feel very sensitive and triggered when he's being criticized, particularly for emotional uh, like uh, consequences or something. And so he might, uh, even though you're not accusing him of anything, just the sheer fact that you're saying that him looking at his phone causes you to feel something, even though you're taking full responsibility for it, his triggers might make him paranoid that you're actually, that you actually are criticizing him and you actually are accusing him, even though you're not. And so uh, what I tell people is uh, you have to go on a campaign to, to change the protocols of your relationship. And uh, the little role play that I did uh, for most couples, that's not going to fix it. You have to say, okay, the first time I, the first 10 times I lay this out to my boyfriend, I'm going to expect uh, the worst and hope for the best. I'm going to expect that it's going to go badly. He's going to get upset. He's not going to say the right thing. He's going to be like, why, you know, wh- uh, how come you can't get over it? Like he, he's going to say the typical defensive things and I'm just going to prepare myself for that. And, but I trust that if, We talk about it enough times, he'll come around, which is usually the case. So, uh, so that's what I'll say about that. Let's go on to another email. All right. This next email is from listener Ace. Listener Ace says, what would you say to someone who's afraid of seeing a psychiatrist and a therapist? My life has been ruined by crippling anxiety to the point of severe disassociation and panic attacks, which happen very frequently. Obviously, I would most likely benefit from something with an anti-anxiolytic properties, but giving up control of my brain to a pharmacy is something disassociation and past traumas have made me terrified of. I'm sure my resistance to therapy comes from a similar place. I'm sure I'm not alone here, and it's probably a very common hurdle new patients have to tackle. Any thoughts? End of email. Uh, Yeah, I get it. Uh, I used to be the same way. Uh, t- I uh, like so I, I suffered from panic attacks. Um, they weren't severe. They I, they're pretty mild because of the um, severity of them and the frequency of them was was pretty mild. But there was a time when um, I as I was a therapist, right? So I would be like, okay, maybe I should think meds, but. I um, am similar. I don't like to lose control of myself. Uh, I, you know, I don't think anyone really does, but uh, that might be particularly triggering for some people, and I think it was for me too. So, you know, so I get that that impulse. Um, if it helps with panic, if if it helps for me to say this, with panic attacks, uh, there are two main kinds of meds. One is is the sort of long term med like SSRIs that will, um, it takes a while for them to kick in. You have to take them every day and they um, tend to reduce your panic attacks as as they occur, you know, from occurring. But they also have side effects. There's, there there can be some personality changes. Um, You don't turn into a zombie the way that a lot of people were characterized. That's more something of a sedative or antipsychotics, but um, and you don't turn into a zombie there either. It just makes you um, groggy or, um, you know, that sort of thing. But anyway, with, with SSRIs, uh, people tend to uh, not have profound changes. Um, they might have a lower libido. They might have higher libido. They might um, just have blunted emotions a little bit, but they still have emotions. Um, so, you know... Uh, so that's one class of, of anti-anxiety medications. The other class is what we call benzodiazepines, which are things that you take in the moment. So you're having a panic attack, you take the benzodiazepine, Valium, Xanax, or like this, and the, uh, the effects are immediate or you know within 15 to 20 or 30 minutes, and the effects wear off. So it, you know, uh, sort of generally speaking after, I don't know, four to 10 hours, the effects will be gone, maybe even just within a few hours. And 
the uh, so you if if you have a panic attack, you take your benzodiazepine. It helps you get through that that panic attack or that event that is very triggering. And by the next day, the the uh, medication is for the most part out of your system and isn't affecting you at all anymore. And the effects that the medication has on your personality is pretty limited. Uh, the way I like to tell people for benzodiazepines, and I'm not a prescriber and not a medical professional. I, I've just taken a lot of classes on, on psychopharmacology. So take everything I'm saying with that in mind. But benzodiazepines, the way I explain it to some people, it's basically a six pack of beer and a pill is the way I say it. Um, if, if you take, a lot of people will report, including myself, because I've taken Valium and Xanax, Xanax is that it's um, essentially like um, in a pill that kicks in 15, 30 minutes later, you're suddenly just feeling good. <laughs> you're just like, and not tremendously good. You're just like, anxiety just doesn't get to you. You know, maybe not everyone can relate to this, but say you go to a party and you don't know a lot of people and you're a little nervous and you, uh, you know, you, you get a glass of wine and maybe you're halfway through your second glass of wine. And then all of a sudden you just kind of feel this, this good feeling and just sort of washes over you with that sort of initial drunkenness. And you're not out of control. You're not like puking or saying weird things, but you're just like, you know, you're just feeling okay. And you're, you're no longer freaking out. And you can walk up to people and say hi, or, you know, it just, if things are, everything's cool and your tension goes away and all that kind of stuff. Now, you know, um, I'm not proposing alcoholic behavior or anything like that, but um, the, uh, I think a lot of people who drink can relate to that feeling. Well, that's essentially what I would say is what Valium and Xanax does to me is that, uh, except the nice thing about benzodiazepines is there's no hangover and, um, and you're not like sloppy. Um, I will say though that I did take a pretty good dose of Valium once when I was going in for surgery, and because I was like, "Oh, this is this is not going to be easy for me." And I was a yeah, I was a little uninhibited, <laughs> you know. I was a little like I went. It was at the, you know, it was, it was dental surgery, and so you know, I go into the dentist office, and um, I was a little bit more goofy, but not tremendously, not embarrassingly so. And I was a little bit uninhibited in the kinds of things I might say in public uh, arenas, but not terribly. Um, similar to the way I might be if I, you know, had a couple glasses of wine. Um, and then after the uh, med sort of um, starts to wear off a little bit, then I got real tired and I took a nap. And I woke up after about an hour and I felt fine. So... And man, did this Valium take away my anxiety? It just eliminated it. Uh, so I, I don't know if it helps to hear that description of those two different classes of meds, the, the longer term anti-anxiety meds versus the, the benzodiazepines that are in the moment. Um, now, benzodiazepines have their problems. They can create uh, dependence because like alcohol, they can feel good and create habit form, you know, create habits of, of taking it all the time. So, you know, it's something to be aware of. A, a lot of prescribers are aware of that and they won't give you a lot of the pills. They'll, they'll give you, you know, if, if you have panic disorder, they'll give you like five pills and cause they know that they need to make sure that they don't just give you a whole bottle full of them, which they used to do. And so, you know, work with your prescriber. But the main thing here, uh, listener Ace, is you need a therapist. And I, I, and what you're saying is that you're you're worried about uh, going to therapy because of your traumas. And that is absolutely normal. One, it's normal to, because you're, you're talking about panic and dissociation. I, I'm, I'm guessing that you've been traumatized early in your life, made to be, made to feel uh, terror and fear and, you know, that kind of thing, witness things or whatever. And it's normal for two main reasons. One is that uh, it's uh, you, when we go to therapy, we, you know, like as we're thinking about going to therapy, we predict, oh, I'm going to have to talk or I'm going to have to talk about my history. I, I might talk about my history. I might talk about my difficulties. And when I start talking about it, I tend to feel distress and I might dissociate. And dissociation is is not pleasant. It doesn't feel good. And so it makes sense that you would want to avoid therapy because you're just like, well, I'm pretty sure if I go to therapy, it's gonna it's gonna be hard on me. It's gonna feel bad. 
Um, I had another reason for why people avoid therapy as, as well. Well, the other reason is because, so not only for that normal reason, but there's another normal reason of when I was young and being traumatized, I was made to feel out of control and in the presence of an authority figure or someone who had more power and dominance over me. And therapy can sort of feel like that sometimes, right? You go to therapy, this person has control over you or has you know some kind of privilege over you, power. And it can feel like, oh, you know, I, I, I usually try to avoid situations like that. So it totally makes sense that, that you, you know, are trepidatious about going to therapy. The, the key though is to find someone who specializes in dissociation and trauma, which is not a very common specialization. If you just randomly went to a therapist, the chance that that person really understands trauma and dissociation is actually pretty low. So you want to find someone that specializes in it. And then, uh, before you even meet with that person, you want to say, so I'm terrified about even going to therapy and I, I need you to go really slow with me. And I need to have control over the situation because if I don't, it, it'll scare me. And so um, I, I, I don't want to talk about my traumas, you know, whatever preference you have it, you, it, to make you yourself feel reassured. Know that you have that right. You deserve the therapy you deserve. You deserve to recover, which a lot of people do from the conditions you're talking about. I mean, I cured, I cured myself of my own panic attack 20 years ago. And man, I mean, uh, my life was even the mild panic attack disorder. I probably had, you know, 10 to 20 panic attacks when I was in my early 20s. Uh, you know, some people like yourself will describe having them almost every day, if not multiple times a day. I can't imagine that feeling. And so uh, uh, it was horrible for me and it was glorious and it ruined, it was ruining my life. I mean, panic attacks are no joke. It was, it was ruining my life and uh, very demoralizing, very horrible. So, uh, you know, the amount of suffering you're going through is quite high and, and you absolutely deserve to recover from that and therapy can help with that. And if it requires you doing your research, finding the right person, maybe getting someone to help you find someone and then um, advocating for yourself and saying, um, I need to be in control. Uh, you deserve that. And a good trauma dissociation therapist should know exactly how to talk with you and ease you into therapy so that you feel, uh, you feel um, comfortable enough to go. The other thing I'll say about meds here is that you don't necessarily need meds to uh, recover from what you are suffering from. Uh, your panic attacks and your, there, there is no medication for dissociation. I mean, you could say there's medication for dissociation in the way that with lowered anxiety, you're less likely to dissociate. But, um, but really, you know, when, when I, tr if, if I, if someone came to me and said they had panic and dissociation, medication would not be the first thing I would be thinking of because usually that just masks the symptoms, which is fine. There's no, there's no, uh, there's nothing wrong with wanting some symptom relief while you get better. But the main thing I'd be thinking about was, okay, this is going to be uh, months, if not years of therapy. I'm going to have to build a relationship with this person. Um, I might attack the panic attacks first because those are probably on average easier to um, cure, so to speak, than dissociation. And then um, I might start working on the dissociation after that or in conjunction. So, um, so you know, you don't have to go to a psychiatrist that, that to me, given what you're saying here, isn't, wouldn't be the first thing I would think of anyway. So um, I hope that helps. Let me know how things go. Okay, let's take a break. And when we get back, I will read some more emails. <laughs> All right, we're back from the break. I usually don't ask people to do this, but if you haven't reviewed us on iTunes, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, I don't usually look at those uh, reviews, but I do occasionally. And I uh, I got this Google alert, and it, I, so I clicked on it, and I went, and it somehow it was the iTunes reviews. And I saw that um, uh, we didn't actually have that many reviews, and I think po probably it's because. Um, I never ask people to write the reviews. So if you could write a review on iTunes, uh, I don't even know how you do it, honestly, because I have an Android. 
um, that would help because iTunes is like the main kind of deal. And the more reviews you have, the higher you are in the search engine, blah, blah, blah. Plus, when we do come across it, it's just really nice to, you know, get those, uh, your thoughts, whether they are good or bad. And uh, there are, you know, we do have some one star reviews, which, um, you know, I'm not going to lie, it hurts my feelings. <laughs> and so it's nice to have um, some uh, at least two, two stars and up reviews uh, to, to, to do. Also, obviously, um, become a patron of the podcast because that's the way we know you like the podcast the best. All right. This next email. My wife and I have been talking about having kids and the same idea comes up for both of us. Both of us have trauma from our parents, and everyone around us also has some sort of trauma from their parents. Is it fair? Is it is it a fair assumption that everyone will have some sort of trauma at some point in their life? Um, so let me chime in here. Yeah, uh, especially the way that I define trauma. Uh, it is um, a broad term. Me and the people who are in my camp tend to use the word trauma in a broad sense. Uh, meaning that any any sort of event that sticks with you in a negative way, maybe is one way of defining it. It's just a matter of degree. Everyone has been through issues that create long term issues. It's just a matter of degree, right? Um, and I've never met I've never met anyone, client or personal or family or friend or whatever. I've never met anyone without significant trauma. Um, I've never met someone who didn't have significant trauma. And there's some obvious examples, obviously being sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused, um, those kinds of things. But also, you know, as I was talking about earlier, being cheated on, that's a, that's a, that will cause some residual things potentially for the rest of your life. Just being dumped in a really horrible way. It, it can be similarly earth shattering. Uh, parents who worked a lot, that can create some issues. Parents who fought in front of you, a divorce, a parent who had a heart attack. You know, we don't usually look at that sort of thing and think it's tra traumatic, but it is. To uh, be there during the, during the heart, atta heart attack or at the very least just hearing about it, it, it depending on the situation, it, it can be traumatic. Death of a pet, sexual harassment at school or work or whatever or from a friend, et cetera. You know, all these things can create uh, issues that last the rest of one's life and create havoc. So I've, you know, when we think of all the different possibilities, I've never met anyone who didn't have, you know, at least a dozen sort of issues uh, that stem from the past. Uh, you ask some more questions here. If so, is it always assumed to be from their parents or their family of origin? Uh, no, but I've never met anyone who didn't have issues that stem from the way their parents parented. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> we, we tend to look at parenting as this dichotomous thing. We're like, okay, well, um, I hope that I parent in a way that is, that creates a healthy child. You know, I, I I'm going to have my kids or, you know, I have my kids and, and I, I'm going to do best by my kids so that they're, um, they're doing really well and uh, they don't need therapy and they're well adjusted. That's my hope is that I parent my kids in that way. Well, uh, and then so, and what I hope doesn't happen is that I parent my kids in a way that creates problems that they need therapy for. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's impossible. It's impossible to parent a child in such a way that they won't need therapy to recover from some aspects of your parenting. And that might be shocking to some of you and a little defeatist, but it is, I've, early in my career, I might've thought that, but it's naive to think that. There's no way that you can parent a child in such a way that they won't need therapy later in life. You know, one example that I give is that, uh, and if you've had young children, you understand this, you cannot avoid disappointing your kid in profound ways. Just Let's just take a very simple example. You go to the park and they're playing with their friends on the jungle gym and they've been playing for a couple hours and you're like, okay, we got to go home. I got to get to work or I got to make dinner or whatever. And you go up to Johnny and you say, okay, it's time to go. Well, for a lot of kids, 
they will just fall apart. They'll just be like, you know, not every kid, obviously, but, you know, some kids will just be like, no, I don't want to leave. And, and you say like, well, okay, I'll give you five more minutes. You give them five more minutes. And then you're like, okay, it's time to go. And Johnny just, no, I, I don't want to leave. I want to stay here. And in that moment, we might look at it like, oh, you know, the kid's just being defiant and you need to create boundaries. For, for a lot of kids in a lot of situations, that situation is legitimately difficult for them. Because of their age and because of their ego and their development, they don't actually have the ability to mitigate the tremendous, uh, you know, negative feelings that they're feeling in that moment. And we just look at that as like, well, you know, it's just normal parenting, right? Well, in that quote unquote normal parenting moment, your kid could actually be having a, a pretty big traumatic moment. Now, in the broad sense of trauma that I'm using, it's, let's just say a significant issue. It's not like the kid, uh, you know, two minutes later is like, well, you know, my parents are good and I, I can't be at the park all day. The, the kid doesn't have the ability to reflect in that way. And so there's, there's this tremendous uh, pain that the child goes through that is, that sticks with them. Or another example is you are, in, you, you know, you're trying to get your kid to go to sleep throughout the night. And although there's various different practices around this, you know, let's just say the kid's two and a half or three and you put the kid to bed or in the crib or wherever you're putting the kid and you, you know, you set up the baby monitor and, and you go downstairs and you see the kid get up and start to cry and you run up there, you try to soothe. Eventually you get to this stage where you're just like, I, I'm just, I have to draw a boundary here. I, I have to, I have to tell Jenny that she has to go to sleep. She has to, she has to try to sleep and I'm not going to run up there every time she freaks out. And so you let it go for 15 minutes and eventually Jenny gives up and she goes back to sleep and you're, you know, you're watching on the baby monitor. She's crying, she's calling out to you. And eventually she goes back to sleep. Again, there's a lot of practices, you know, uh, along these lines, but if you're a parent, you know, you've been through at least some, to some extent, th these, these phases. Again, in that moment, the child is uh, uh, often in legitimate pain, but it's a pain that parents just have to put your kids through because the world cannot revolve around them. At some point they have to figure out things on their own and it's painful to go through that transition. When a child is going through that, it's not like, well, you know, it's just three-year-old pain, who cares? It, it's legitimate pain that creates problems for one, for, for all of us later in life. And we all need to sift through those issues. You know, we all are sensitive to criticism. We all are sensitive to abandonment. We all are somewhat paranoid about our spouse's uh, love for us. You know, it's just a matter of degree based on, and, and all those, uh, you know, sort of mishaps in our psyche are at least somewhat based on these negative experiences we went through as a child. Um, I, I, I recently went to a baby shower for my colleague at Antioch, uh, Michelle Finley, and um, people were writing uh, cards to the baby. You know, you're, you, there was this art project and you make this little card and you could write whatever you want to. And I thought about what I wanted to write and then I wrote, um, may your parents parent you in a way that results in you needing the least amount of therapy. Uh, that's what I wrote. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, because I'm a cheeky bastard, but uh, that's what I wrote. You know, may your parents parent you in a way that results in you needing the least amount of therapy. And obviously, you know, that implies that uh, no matter how well someone is parented, that they're going to need some therapy. You go on to say here in the email, I'm hoping if we have a kid that having the awareness of trauma would help us not, uh, would, would help, would help us not induce traumatic events. And I am not sure how likely that is to happen. Do you have any thoughts on this or experience with how likely any trauma one has boils down to their parents. Any trauma? Anyway, um, do you have any thoughts on this or experience with how likely any trauma one has boils down to their parents? Huh? I don't really understand that sense. But anyway, um, so you're saying, you know, that you're, uh, you've been traumatized and does that help you 
or hinder you as a parent? It absolutely can help, particularly by the way you're asking the question. I mean, you're aware of the traumas and by the way you're asking the question, you're, you're open and you're thinking about it. So you've obviously already recovered a long way from those traumas and that will help you uh, to understand. I mean, as I said, we've all been traumatized as children and the better we understand that those traumas, the better we are as, as parents um, in terms of, you know, not recreating those. Having said that, having trauma, as we all have, creates blind spots, uh, depending on the, on the degree. If, if we've been through a lot of trauma, it raises the risk of some of the blind spots. Like there's a lot of blind spots, but um, some obvious ones that pop into my mind are overcompensating. Like, let's say you were traumatized by your parents being neglectful. And so you overcompensate by being overprotective of your kids or your parents were overly aggressive and harsh with you. And so you overcompensate by not having boundaries and limits with your kids, which is harmful to children. Or another uh, blind spot is you were modeled a particularly uh, way of parenting that is not healthy. And so the way that I, and I see this all the time in my clients is there, it, it, so, so let's say you're, you're, you're physically abused growing up by your mother and you know intellectually that um, doing what she did was wrong you know like uh, hitting your kids is wrong calling your kid calling kids names is wrong so you, you know that and and in your in your head you're like I'm not going to do that with my kids but the vibe that you experienced it moved the range of possibilities you know because all of all of us parents have to uh, at times be at least somewhat aggressive with our kids. I mean, not physically per se, but we, you know, they are picking up a rock and they're gonna throw it at younger sister's head. You don't just wanna calmly say, um, hey, Johnny, don't throw the rock. Like if it's an emergency, you gotta yell, you gotta scream. <laughs> no, you know, you gotta, you gotta jump up and really get aggressive in, in terms of the way you're talking. Or, um, your kid is throwing a, throwing a tantrum on purpose in the grocery store and you're fed up and you really, and you know, you put on your mommy voice or your daddy voice and you get in the child's face and you say, if you don't stop this, I am going to lock you in the car <laughs> or, or whatever you say, you know, if you don't stop this, you are not going to be able to watch TV for the next week. Do you understand me? You know, there, there's a firm voice that, parents with a lot of kids, unfortunately, have to resort to. And, you know, it's aggressive and it's normal. But, and there are various other parenting practices that sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But anyway, a lot of parents will do that and it's usually fine or it recreates the, the normal residue <laughs> that one retains into later life that they need therapy for. So as you're making decisions in the moment on when to, uh, you know, raise your voice, in what way do you raise your voice? For how long do you raise your voice? What's the intensity of the way you raise your voice? Even though you're not physically hitting the kids, um, you're raising your voice and the range of what feels okay to you is actually uh, askew in that you, it feels normal and okay. To, let's just say like for, um, for healthy parents, who not healthy parents, but for, for, for people who went through relatively healthy parenting, they will ratchet up their, their aggressive, uh, intense voice up to like a four out of 10. You know, you're in the safe way and the kid's throwing a tantrum on the ground and grabbing the Cheerios and throwing it across the, the, the aisle. And you know your kid is just doing it for effect. And so you raise your intensity up to four to really emphasize, okay, I've had enough. That's enough of that. Um, and you raise it up to a four. Well, because for some of us who have been through uh, very you know, abusive households, you know, your range of what feels right to you uh, gets raised. And so you might raise your intensity in that situation up to a seven because in your internal sense of what feels right to you, it feels right to ratchet it up to a seven when all you needed to do was a four 
and the four was actually the more appropriate way of, of doing it. Now, it's a blind spot, and so you won't see it is the thing. As a parent, you won't see it. And so if you've been traumatized, you, you need to spend extra time reflecting on these kinds of things. Like how am I, am I going too far with that? And it doesn't mean that you just give up on parenting and second guess everything that you do. By no means do that. But you might want to check in with a family therapist, a parenting specialist to, to, to problem solve about that. And you want to find someone who really knows what they're doing because there's, uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings and, and um, myths around parenting that are even in my field. Um, so that's my advice on that. At the very least, like one of the easiest things you can do is just ask your spouse because they're usually watching you. And so you just be like, so, you know, so yesterday when we were at the grocery store, and I was really trying to get Timmy to stop throwing that tantrum. Did I get too intense in that moment? Because I've been thinking about that. And, you know, just have that conversation with your spouse. Or if you are the spouse and you see your husband or wife becoming more intense uh, than they need to be, you know, sit down with them later that day or the next day and say, so I just want to check in about the grocery store incident. Um, it, I know that it was a stressful moment. I was stressed out but I kind of feel like you ratcheted it up a little higher than it needed to be. And it sort of scared me because it, it felt um, a little too strong. Um, I, I agree that Timmy was freaking out and it, it's fucking annoying when he does that, but, um, but I, I just felt like it was a little high. And so, you know, can we have a conversation about that? Um, you don't want to do it in the moment because you don't want to undermine your your fellow compatriot in your parenting efforts. But but later on, you know, you can have those conversations. And uh, if you've been traumatized, it, it's hard to see it, right? Because it'll it'll feel like well, but uh, it felt like the right amount of intensity. But again, it just feels that way because you were modeled a very high level of intensity in terms of parenting that is um, uh, not not the balanced way of parenting kids. Again, I don't want to create any paranoia. Uh, you know, everyone's muddling through it the best they can. And um, you, you just got to do what you got to do in the moment. But a little bit of reflection from every parent, frankly, and checking in with your spouse or other people who are observing your parenting skills is something to do. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to heed other people's advice because everyone's just trying to figure this out on their own. But it does mean that, you know, you kind of reflect on it and you think, okay, um, what could I do here? What, 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 how, how could I adjust this? How could I adjust that? Um, what, do I, what do I need to do um, to have the best sort of practices with my kid that will, um, you know, uh, be the best for my kid? Because I obviously love my kid and um, I'm desperate to uh, parent in the best way possible. Okay, let's go on to another email. All right, this next email is from patron Andrea from Germany. She writes, I was wondering if you could make an episode about your experience with adolescent therapy. I am working in child and adolescent forensic services as a novice therapist. There are some recurring topics in therapy that can be quite challenging. I've noticed that my patients are very jealous of each other and there's a lot of rivalry. Even though they are dissocial, they demand justice and equal treatment and constantly compare themselves to each other. I've been trying to explain the reasons for individual treatment based on their individual backgrounds many times, which only ends in endless discussions. Also, it seems that they are very sensitive to perceived neglect, which isn't surprising considering their past. Anyways, those, those thought patterns are the main cause for their anger, despair, and a lot of conflicts. Do you have any advice on how to address those issues? Yeah, so it sounds like you're working in a group setting or even a residential setting, which is uh, you know quite different than when you're working individually with with teens in therapy. And uh, you know, working in groups is extremely uh, stressful, um, and that needs to be uh, understood. <laughs> Some of the most traumatic events I've ever had as a therapist have been in group homes with teenagers. Before I became a therapist, I started working at a, um, or I worked at a group home for teenagers and there was like five beds. It was just a house in suburbia and they, they um, renovated it or they actually didn't renovate it at all. They just 
um, change this like split level 70s uh, built house in uh, Linwood area or Everett area into a group home for kids. And there they were five teenagers and they were they were usually girls. I'm not sure if that was on purpose, but the um, probably was. And they, they would just, you know, give different bedrooms out to the kids. And the basement was where all the workers would work. And it was extremely stressful. Um, I, so I was working there as that like essentially like a youth worker. I wasn't a therapist, but I was there essentially to kind of, I don't know, corral them or entertain them or something. And uh, there was this one night when I was there and I'd be there, you know, I'd, I'd essentially the way that the job worked was I'm, I'm there for eight hours, making sure that they don't kill each other and maybe taking them to appointments maybe entertaining them, making sure that they don't um, break any rules, making sure they eat at, at the right time. And uh, I'll never forget, I really cared about people and always have, and I'm 24 or something, and I'm trying to do the best job I can. I'm really nervous about the job. I really feel out of my league because I'm not a super extroverted person. You have to be very extroverted when you're working in a situation like that because there's um, you don't have to be extroverted in personality, but you have to act it because you can't, you can't be a wallflower in a situation like that. Um, anyway, so I'll just never forget this. This one girl um, was, started targeting me and she was, she was just like, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know what got up. I don't know what B got in her bonnet, but she decided that she was going to start attacking me verbally. And at first I handled it. Okay. But that she said something that just, completely wrecked me and I started crying and back then I didn't cry very easily <laughs> and uh and I didn't cry a lot but I started to tear up and I and uh, on the way on the drive home that night I just I'll never forget I was just like um it was very hard and I remember after that I had sort of I was a sort of different person there was like the me before that moment and there was the me after before that moment with that uh, for that moment with that teenager, I was an open person. I, will, I was trusting of people. After that moment, I had a certain jadedness and self-protection, self-protectiveness that um, I needed in order to survive while working with clients in general, but particularly teens. And whenever I would have a supervisee or a student who would run into a situation like that, I would often tell them that story. It's like, Every naive, young, novice therapist has to go an, through an event like that to break them of their naivete and to make them realize that you could be doing wonderful work, you could be doing the best job you, you can, you can have very good intentions, you could be a very caring person, and someone can still verbally harm you at work because of the difficulties that they went through growing up. And you just have to make sure you have a certain self-preservation uh, mechanism in place when you're working with these kinds of people because you just never know when they're going to target you. And so um, it sounds like maybe you're working in a situation like that. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, and, you, you know, you're talking about how they are, um, they're dissocial, meaning antisocial, like conduct disorder, this kind of thing. They demand justice and equal treatment. They're constantly comparing themselves to each other. I'm guessing that they're comparing like resources, like, you know, he gets, he got a better dinner than I did or something. They won't accept your explanations about individual treatment. They're very sensitive to perceived neglect. And you say it's not surprising given their past. And they have a lot of negative emotions and behaviors, anger, despair, conflict. And yeah, so, you know, you're asking, how do, how do you address those issues? Well, you know, you seem to understand the situation pretty well. You're not framing it in this distorted way. You seem to have a good grasp on it. And the key is corrective experiences. Now, I don't know what sort of role you have as the, the, the novice therapist that you say that you are. If you're in a residential treatment facility or in a group setting, sometimes, you know, they throw novice therapists into situations like that. And really all that you're doing is babysitting and uh, very little of your work can involve actual therapy. 
so if you're dealing with a lot of conflicts and you're trying, you know, to um, get them to calm down, you're trying to get them to comply, you're trying to get them to not fight with each other, um, then, you know, you, that's therapeutic in a way, but you're not going to have a lot of time and they might not even see you in the way that they need to see you in order for you to really do good therapy with them. So part of the frustration might just be the role that you've been thrust into because uh, it would be a lot easier if you could um, get the kids alone, right? If you could get each kid alone in your office and you weren't in charge of sort of explaining whether or not they're going to get resources or not. Uh, but the, the key is, is corrective experiences. They went through a lot of difficulty growing up. They probably didn't get the nurturance that they deserved or needed. They probably were mistreated in a lot of ways. And um, they need to have a corrective experience to help them develop uh, health, healthily. Nurturance, care, love, positive regard, and even special treatment. You know, they're, they're fighting with each other the way siblings will fight with each other when the parents aren't giving enough resources. And uh, that's normal. You know, they're, they've learned, these kids, that unless they speak up, they won't get their needs met. And, and even when they do speak up, they still don't really get their needs met. But they definitely will not get their needs met if they don't speak up for themselves. And even potentially see the world through this very um, resource-depleted lens. So, uh, they're, so it's normal. And they're, and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so... Uh, in order to help them develop, you might actually have to give them special treatment. And, you know, you just do the best you can. You just try not to get involved. In the same way that when you have two kids, when they're fighting with each other, like two seven-year-olds, about, you know, well, he gets a, he got a, a, you know, a lollipop, and I only got this. And you just, you know, you do your best, but you don't have to get into it with them. It's not like seven-year-olds walk away from situations like that saying, oh, I got a good explanation from my parents about why my brother got a lollipop and I only got, you know, this ice cream sandwich. It's not, you know, kids don't usually um, walk away saying, thank you for the wonderful explanation and you're a good parent. So if you're trying to walk away from a situation where a bunch of teenagers are fighting with each other uh, with a feeling like, um, everyone was satisfied and there's a lot of closure, uh, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree. The other, the weather, the main way to look at people like this, and I recommend that um, all clinicians look at their um, clients like this if they need to, and particularly if it's accurate, is that it, given that these teenagers have been through a lot, they're developmentally and emotionally not necessarily a teenager. So you can't really treat them like a teenager. They, the way you're describing them, at least at times, they're dipping into what I would characterize as someone who's like two, three, four years old. Someone who has a lot of heart, has a hard time with emotions, is very selfish, doesn't really empathize with other people, is um, quite emotional when they don't get what they want. Now, when we see a three-year-old do that, we're just like, well, you know, that's, that's three-year-olds. It's not a big deal. But when we see like a 17-year-old or a 13-year-old doing this, somehow we look at them and you're like, well, you're almost an adult. You should be beyond that. Well, if they've been mistreated, neglected, abandoned, abused, then emotionally and developmentally, they aren't that age. They are still two, three, four years. In fact, there's parts of them that are probably still de developing as like a six-month-year-old in terms of needing to be held needing to have that um, physical nurturance. And so when you see them that way, one, it helps you to cope better with it because you're not, your expectations are a lot lower. And two, it gives you a direction for how to treat the people. So, you know, if you have a 13 year old who is generally developmentally um, uh, okay and hasn't been mistreated and they start to get a little snotty, you can talk to that 13 year old and be like, hey, you're being snotty, I need you to stop being snotty. And the 13-year-old, given that they've been raised well enough, will have the resources to, to withstand that and to retain the notion that they're a good person and that you're a good person and weather the storm. Whereas with a 13-year-old uh, who has been mistreated, abandoned, neglected, abused, uh, and you say something and they're being snotty and you're like, hey, you're being snotty, that 13-year-old might not have the trust in themselves, in others the working models, the schemas that are necessary to withstand that criticism and to uh, weather the storm and to communicate what they're really trying to communicate. You know, 13-year-olds uh, often are snotty because they don't know how to communicate their feelings. And uh, so 
so when you're looking at a 13 year old being snotty and they have this terrible background and they're having a hard time redirecting when you're saying stop being snotty just see them as a three-year-old and treat them like a three-year-old just be like oh well you know you can't expect a three-year-old to um not be snotty <laughs> yeah when when they decide that they're going to be snotty you know when a three-year-old is like i'm in a snotty mood and i'm going to be snotty um you know you do your best you can but you're not you're not dependent on them um having a, a rosy uh disposition so so make so so have corrective experiences that's always the key and then making sure that you treat them as the developmental stage that they actually are now it's not to say that the teenagers don't have developmental aspects of a teenager because they probably do you know puberty and that sort of thing but um uh, they definitely will dip back in i mean all of us regress to a three-year-old every now and then but for some people they do it more so than others having said all that again from the way you're talking about this, I suspect that you're in a role where it's really hard to actually treat these people because you might be, because, you know, the way you're describing your conflicts with them, it sounds like you're actually kind of like, um, just kind of like my old job where part of your job at least is, is corralling them and making sure that they follow the rules or something. And uh, I just have to say to mix that with you actually trying to be a therapist for them is, is actually really hard. So you might be kind of uh, swimming upstream on that one. Okay, this next email didn't have a name and it just says, could you elaborate on the differences between paranoid and narcissistic personality disorder? I've noticed that narcissistic patients are very suspicious, perceive threat and betrayal everywhere and tend to hold grudges for a long time, which is quite similar to paranoid personality disorder. Yeah, so the, the question is good, but is it's such a complex answer. Uh, certainly people with narcissistic personality disorder can, uh, you know, be suspicious, as you're saying, and um, perceive threat and betrayal everywhere. It, one way to look, again, at all personality disorders is that they all essentially come from the same place and some one of the ways of one of the ways of looking at personality disorders is that um, when you see similarities between the personality disorders what's happening is that um, you're noticing the underlying reasons for the personality disorder is the same it's just that we as observers of these people tend to look at the most surface um, behaviors and categorize them on that. So someone who's paranoid, so let's just start from the beginning. W people who have paranoid personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder uh, likely come from similar backgrounds in that they were not given enough love and, and attention and nurturance and attunement and security and love when they were uh, young children and or they were abused. And so as a result, they developed schemas, person pervasive personality traits, whatever you want to call it, that developed in response to that reality and involves a way of seeing the world, which was accurate when they were young, and a way of coping with their own needs and their own, um, and their own ways of seeing the world. So, you know, you're mistreated and you, as a young person, um, you start to have this idea like, I, I think what's happening here is people aren't really here for me. You know, you're two years old. And this is mostly subconscious. And you, you start to draw these conclusions like, I, I want my parents and other people to love me and notice me and care about me. But I'm starting to realize that I don't think they do. In fact, I think some of these people actually have malicious intent when it comes to me. It seems like my parents are kind of childish in some ways and have these internal thoughts of um, wanting to hurt me. And you can develop a, a sort of uh, accurate schema and way of seeing the world, which is to be very suspicious of other people. Well, from there, you can develop paranoid personality disorder, which is um, a certain sort of mode to be in to cope with all that. 
But you could also see developing borderline. You could also see developing narcissistic personality disorder. Um, so in terms of what you're presenting, um, yeah, uh, there can be an either. And I, I encourage everyone to um, not be so fixated on the individual labels for personality disorders because one, they're complicated and the, there's a lot of overlap. But two, there's so much weird shit like on the internet in terms of understanding this sort of thing. You know, we, we like we tend to see personality disorders the way that we see other kind of medical conditions. It's like, okay, either you have, uh, you know, cancer of the stomach or you have leukemia or you have um, Alzheimer's, you know, these are discrete different conditions, diseases, disorders, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. And we tend to look at personality disorders in the same way, which is, which is actually not very accurate or useful. It's um, more accurate just to see people as they are and then say, hmm, it sounds kind of sounds like I could characterize this person as paranoid. I could also characterize them as, nar as narcissistic because um, they seem to share the same presentation as other presentations that I either understand, you know, in terms of the way I see paranoid and narcissistic or I've read in books and I've heard other people talk. It's just more important to, to treat the individual based on who they are and, and what they are and not worry so much about the label. All right, one more email here. This email is from Anonymous in the Midwest. She writes... In a recent episode uh, you did with Umberto called Why Do People Cheat? You were talking with Umberto about his relationship with his aunt and how she took on the role of mother for one year before leaving him. You mentioned you would have advised her that while she could be good to him, she should not get so close with him because it could be harmful to him when she leaves. That makes a lot of sense, but it got me thinking about how I might be doing that to people I work with in therapy. I'm a student in a PsyD program about to complete my internship, and I feel like I'm in the same place I've been at every year for the past four years of grad school between internship and practic practicums. I always feel so bad and guilty about terminating with my clients, like I'm a sociopath that manipulates them into opening up and feeling close to me, and then one year later, I'm like, see you never. I try to talk about termination from the start, and really remind my clients as we get closer to the end and make space for talking about and make space for talking about it if they want to. If I'm being honest, I think most of them are okay with the way we terminate, but there are some that termination feels like uh, like mutual heartbreaking. I'm wondering what kind of advice you have had. I'm wondering what kind what kind of advice you might have for this these unnatural endings. My current internship site is very protocol driven and there isn't a whole lot of room in the manuals for discussion about terminations. I've tried bringing it up in supervision and people are never dismissive, but the responses I get make me think that they don't think termination is that big of a deal. Any advice you have or suggestions on things to read would be much appreciated. End of email. Well, I'm really glad that you care, Anonymous in the Midwest, and I'm really sorry that you're not getting the support you need. It sounds like you like your colleagues, but I have to say, like the way you're uh, describing it, it's this is something that I've seen before um, in uh, you know the, my field, and it's awful. It drives me nuts. I mean, at what point in our field did we get away from the human aspects of humans? <laughs> I mean, uh, the notion that we should just be like, well, you know, termination, whatever. Uh, I just don't understand that. Like, um, certainly all, all these people have a heart and they care. So why isn't it on their radar? Why don't they talk about it? Is it some sort of like philosophical thing? Like, well, we're, ma we're about protocols and manualized evidence-based treatment and there's, there's no room for empathy or compassion or so. I don't, I don't really, I just don't understand that, that thought process. So I'm glad you're feeling the feelings and you're trying to attend to that. Termination is rough. It is heartbreaking. There's, there's just really no way around it. And you have to just accept that, you know, uh, some kids will agree. I mean, adults, it doesn't matter how old the, the, the clients are. Sometimes kids have a harder time because they don't really understand why it's ending. And the therapy with kids can be so bonding, you know, um, and, you know, some of the kids, some of your clients will grieve the loss after the termination. They will 
uh, be in grief in the same way that if, you know, their aunt had died or something. And you will grieve some of the losses. You probably already have. And so you just have to see it that way, that it, it's a loss. There's going to be grief. And it's not going to be all fun and games. It's, it's going to be hard. It is going to be heartbreaking. And so you just have to, if you see it that way, then it'll help you to kind of take care of them in that way. And also just accept that that's just how things are. It's sort of be like if you're working at a hospice center and you're upset that some of your patients are dying. It's like, it's, it's an inevitable part of the job that is not ideal. And of course, if you could change things, then you would not ever have to terminate with any of your clients. I've actually had the benefit of that, is that um, kind of randomly and also to my own sort of engineer, engineering of my career, I've rarely had to terminate with a client um, for uh, either unnatural reasons or um, reasons that I left a job, um, just briefly. So I got an internship and I got hired at my internship site. And so I didn't have to terminate with any of my internship clients. This was 25 years ago. And then once I, then I went into private practice and as I was going into private practice and I was getting more and more work, I went to my agency people and I was just like, so I need to cut back on my hours at the agency um, or I need to quit. But I'd really just rather just cut back because even though I'm not being paid that much here, I, I still wanna work with the clients that I've been working with for the past few years. And so they let me um, work with my clients until they all naturally terminated. And what that meant was like for a couple years, I was, <laughs> I remember it was like Monday evenings or something. I would go to the agency from like five to 9 p.m. and I would see these long-term clients and that's all I would do. I'd never go to staff meetings. <laughs> and um, it, eventually the agency was like, well, we can't really have you on the employee benefits that you are. I wasn't getting benefits, but anyway, eventually they just fired me. And what I did was um, I brought a couple clients into my private practice. So, um, and then once I was, in, and, I've, and I've been in a continual practice in Seattle privately since, you know, 97. And so I have never really had to terminate with any of my clients. I've had some internship uh, situations after that, like in my doctorate, but it was a kind of a similar situation. So, and a part of that is because I, I really did not want to go through that grief process. Now, you know, I've obviously terminated with a lot of clients over the years, probably thousands of clients, but it's, you know, there's something about when you're working with kids and to the, the, the kids, it, it can feel like right in the middle of your relationship, you just suddenly say that you're leaving, even though you've been prepping them all along, even though you've been saying, so by the way, you know, I'm, this is a short term thing. And in six months, um, I'm going to have to terminate with you and we're not going to be able to see each other. So I just want to make sure, you know, some, some kids will still get, you know, pretty attached to you. And, um, and so, yeah, so it's heartbreaking. Um, and like I said, grieve for yourself, make sure you get therapy. You know, if say for instance, uh, you had a nephew that you really bonded with over the span of a few years. And then one day um, your, your nephew and his family and you know, your siblings, uh, they move to uh, Brazil and you never get to see your nephew anymore. Well, it would, there'd be crying, there would be, uh, and let's say for whatever reason, you can't Skype with them or anything. And so they're just gone and you never get to see your nephew again. Well, there's gonna be tears, there's gonna be sadness, there's gonna be a loss and you're not gonna see the silver lining on that. You're just gonna be like, this sucks. I don't get to see my nephew anymore. So that just has to be acknowledged. You know, With some of your therapeutic relationships, it's gonna be like that. And it's just part of the job. Uh, you get used to it over time, but um, but you, you do what you can. You, one, you're doing all the things you're supposed to be doing. You don't lie to your clients um, and you tell them right up front, this is a time limited situation. Um, so you do that. Then as the date approaches, you talk about it with them and say, okay, we have four more sessions. I just wanna make sure that you know that. Um, but you also want to tell the, you know, the kid that you appreciate them, that you like them, 
that um, you're not leaving because of them, that you're leaving because of job stuff and that you'll never forget them. You can do little ceremonies at the end where you exchange like drawings or something that can be very uh, meaningful to some people. Um, and, uh, you know, little, little, or collages where you, uh, you know, you're the, the way you see that person, that kind of thing. And, um, but once it's terminated, you, you know, in most situations, you're not going to ever talk to them ever again. And even if you bumped into them, you can't really engage with them. So, um, so it's, so it's going to be sad in the same way that you would never see your nephew again, you know, or you're not going to see your nephew for a while. It's, it's sad and it sucks and it's reality and it's human. But getting back to Umberto's aunt. So Umberto, so the, the situation, if people don't remember, was that Umberto was being abandoned routinely by his dad or his mom and then at one point when he was young, I don't know, four or five years old, his aunt became a surrogate mom sort of to him after his mom had abandoned him. And he became very attached to her naturally. And after a year or so, she moved away and he you know, didn't see her again for a long time. And so that was another big loss. And so I was reacting like, oh my God, like, why did she do that? If she knew she was going to leave, why did she... Uh, become like a, a mother figure. So that's different than what you're doing. What you're doing as a clinician is you're a clinician that the kid knows your clinician, they go to your office. You know, Umberto was looking at his aunt like a mom and probably treated her very much like a mom. And the aunt lived with her, him and that kind of thing. Also, the aunt, from my understanding, didn't really leave well. She didn't terminate well. Uh, from my understanding, she just one day she's like, boom, I'm gone. Um, also, from my understanding, she didn't prep Umberto for leaving. Uh, and Umberto might not remember it well, but I suspect, given the patterns in, the, in Umberto's family, is that she didn't you know, start with, by the way, little boy, my nephew Umberto, I will be leaving one day, so you know, just get ready for that. One day you're not going to ever see me again. <laughs> um, I, I doubt she did that. So uh, those are a lot of big differences um, between Umberto's aunt and you and me, for that matter. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself. And when you email me, you want to go to the website, the Contact Us page, and understand that... Um, I don't have a ton of time to respond to every email, so I, I just try to do my best. Um, so I hope you understand that. And take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>